Rise Church, it's good to be in the house. It's good to have fun. It's good to laugh in church. Come on, Jesus um, created this day to be enjoyed. And um, we have a, a, a gift in the house today. Um, I have a friend of mine that is gonna be preaching the word of God to you today. And if you're a first time guest and somebody was like, you gotta come to this church because the preacher is really good, they were right. Um, <laughs> And so that just means you get to come back next week. And, uh, but, but today, I, I have a friend in town, and um, what you need to know about this friend of mine is that uh, seven years ago, our church is nine years old, but seven years ago, my wife and I stumbled upon probably the greatest thing that has ever come into our lives outside of our kids and, and other, you know, you, of course. Um, we stumbled upon something called the Next Level Relational Network, and it's a network of pastors that just do life together. And when we found them, we knew we found our family. We, we found our tribe, we, we, we were pastoring our church and God was doing great things, but we were lonely and we didn't know people and we needed some friends in our lives to come alongside of us and encourage people that maybe were a couple steps ahead of us. And when we found the Next Level Relational Network, we knew, man, this is it. And we've been doing life together with them for seven years. It's the same thing we ask of you, like get in a group, get connected with people, let people know what's going on in your life. When you're having a hard day, you need people that can encourage you. And how many of you know there's nobody that can encourage a pastor like another pastor, because they get it, you know? They know how people drive you crazy. Obviously, I'm not talking about the 10 o'clock, I'm talking about the 8.30 service, okay? <laughs> but like, when I'm going through something difficult, I have a pastor that I can call in my life, or a group of pastors, and say, hey, I'm struggling, can you pray for me today? Or they can call me. And Pastor Dan Stauffer, who is here with us today, is one of those pastors. He's not just in the network, he leads the network. And he's gonna share a little bit more with you about that. Um, but what I know about him is to my wife and I, he is a constant source of encouragement. That if I need anything, he is a phone call away. And he's not gonna go, oh, it's Adam again. It's Adam, what's up? And, 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 and what can I do and how can I serve you? And so um, we asked him um, to come to our church and all weekend he's been pouring into our team, to our staff, and now he gets to preach and pour into you. And here's what you know, um, you need to know. Anytime we bring somebody up on this stage, um, it ain't the B team, okay? We bring, we bring somebody that we know is gonna impart a word of God to your life. And so I want you to open your hearts, lean in. Come on, we're a church that shows honor. Would you stand up on your feet? Come on, welcome my friend, Pastor Dan Stauffer. Come on, keep standing for a second. Keep standing, thank you. It's such a pleasure to, to be here with all of you today and just super excited about what God has been doing in your church even over this weekend. But um, I get to travel a lot. As Pastor Adam said, we've got a, a network of about 138 churches right now and, and uh, I get to travel and be at all of them. I get to be around pastors all the time. And uh, you breathe rare air here at Rise Church. You have uh, a, a couple of family that loves you that sacrifices for you, that prays for you, that fasts for you, that seeks God's face for you. And first and foremost, they pursue God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength because you can't lead somebody to a place you haven't gone yourself. And they just love you. Would you do me a favor as well as honor them? Thank God for your pastors right now, Rise Church. We love you. We honor you guys. Come on. So good. You can go ahead and be seated today. Come on, Jacksonville hasn't heard that amount of cheering, you know, they, at the game. Not, I, I already went there. I already went there. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's so good to be with you. We're just having so much fun. This is like family. I feel like I'm just with family. And uh, it's just easy to be able to minister, easy to be able to share and communicate. And uh, I'm here not uh, really on my own. My family um, is a part of this as well. Let's me go and, and serve and be at churches. I got a picture of them. We'll throw up on the screen here. Uh, I've got my beautiful wife, Stephanie. And then I've got three kids. I've got uh, my oldest daughter, Eden, right here in the middle, 24, 20-year-old daughter, Emma, and then my 17-year-old son, Grant. And uh, we were able to plant a church in 2008 in New Jersey, and uh, we're able to lead that church. And, and uh, we just, we love the church. We love the local church. Our, our kids love God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, and just so thankful for them. And then I'm, I'm also here on behalf of my pastors, Pastors Matt and Sarah Keller, Next Level Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Got a picture of them as well so you can see who they are. Um, they love you. 
And uh, they love your pastors, and, and, and on behalf of them, they just wanted me to say hello, say hi to Rise Church, let them know we love you, they, they pray for you, they, 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 just, they love your, your pastors. And uh, it was in 2002, just a little over 20 years ago, that they moved to Fort Myers from small town Indiana, the only home they ever knew, and uh, to plant a life-giving church. And in those early days, it was really hard. Um, they tell the story that they were sitting on the edge of their bed in their small 800 square foot apartment on the wrong side of town and just feeling alone, feeling hopeless, feeling clueless and crying out to God, tears running down their face with a prayer of this was, God, if you let us live through this, and it was a big if, but God, if you let us live through this, we'll do whatever we can to make sure no ministry couple ever has to feel the way that we feel right now. And that was the birth of the Relational Network. That's how my wife and I met Pastors Matt and Sarah. Uh, that's how your pastors met them. And uh, we're, they're just, their heart is for us. And uh, we just get to love on churches and love on pastors and, and make it possible for us to be able to do life together. So I just wanted you to know where, where we're coming from today and, and on behalf of why we're here. But uh, I want to take a moment today and talk about what it means to be the church. You know, we're at a, at a great church. We can go to church. We can say we have a church. But what does it mean to actually to be the, the church, to be the church? Now, I don't know about you. Actually, I do know about you. Um, when Super Bowl Sunday, our team's not on, usually in, on the, in the game, right? Got really quiet really fast. I'm sorry. I'm just going downhill. I started low, and I'm just going to stay low. But anyway, my team's not in it either. I'm a Steelers fan. I got one Steelers fan right here. Woo-woo. Come on, give it up, my friend. I saw you walk in. I felt the spirit of the living God walk in your building today as he walked in. I was like, yes, Lord. I know Jesus is here. I love it. But uh, so I'm watching the Super Bowl, and just like you, we're sitting there, we're, we're eating our wings, we're eating our nachos, we're eating our pizza, all the bad food, but we're just having a great time. We're watching a game with teams that aren't even our own team, but we're wearing our team's jersey, aren't we? Why? Because we want to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. And Rise Church, can I tell you today, you are a part of something bigger than yourself. You're a part of the church. The church is the body of Christ. The church is described as a family. It's described as a body. It's described as a house, a, a home. And we're a part of that. But what does it mean to actually be the church? I want to take a look at a passage of scripture here in Mark chapter 2. And looking just at a, a few verses. But Mark chapter 2 verse 1 begins this way. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered into Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. And so if just leave that verse on the screen. So a few days later, because a few days prior, Jesus was in Capernaum and he healed a man with leprosy. He told him, hey, don't go tell anybody. Just go and, and do this ceremony. But the man went and spread the word. He told everybody about what had happened in his life. They all knew that he was a leper before. And they saw him completely different, completely healed, changed, never the same again. And he told everybody how that happened. He said the name Jesus. Jesus did this. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus healed me. So when Jesus comes back into this town, a whole crowd just floods this place where Jesus was at. Verse 2 says, so many gathered there that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And then Jesus preached the word to them. They had space issues. They had, there wasn't enough room for everybody. There wasn't, they had to do, you know, if, if it was like us, it'd be doing multiple services. Everybody that came to church in one service today wouldn't fit in this room. It would fill it up just like what was happening with Jesus that day. People were everywhere. They're sitting all over the place. There was no clear aisleways. They didn't have a fire marshal back then. There was other people were everywhere, sitting all around Jesus to where he could barely move. And nobody else could even get in the room. And then verse three says this, some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Right, church, can we pray one more time and just ask God's blessing on this message? Heavenly Father, right now, we, we ask for your presence to flood this room. Spirit of the living God, we invite you to rest in here. Rest on what we hear, what we see. Rest on what we're receiving in our own hearts today. And may we be changed by your word, never the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that, would you say Amen. Amen. So what does it mean to actually be the church? Well, number one, from this passage of scripture, the first thing that I see of what it means to be the church is we do the heavy lifting. We do the heavy lifting. In, in, in that verse, it said that four men carried a man that was paralyzed on a mat. 
They grabbed the corner. We don't know if they, if they had a relationship, a prior relationship with this person. We don't know if this was the, the first time that they ever saw him. We don't know how often that they had passed by this paralyzed man. But what we do know is that this day, they made a decision. We're not just going to walk past this paralyzed man. We know that Jesus is the healer. He's the savior. He's the son of the living God. Whatever Jesus touches, lives are changed. We need to get this man. We saw what he did with the leper last week. We know what he could do for the paralyzed person this week. So they grabbed a corner of the, grabbed the corner of a mat and carried him to Jesus. Now turn to the person next to you and say, it's time to grab a corner. Come on, time to grab a corner. Turn to the other person that you were avoiding to make any sort of eye contact with. Let them know that means you too. Grab a corner. They decided they were going to grab a corner. Now I don't, I don't, know where your life is at. Most of us, you know, we, we might not be struggling with a physical paralysis. Some of us might be, but I promise you that just based on the sheer numbers in this room, statistics would tell us that there's many of us in this room right now that our marriages are paralyzed, that there's many of us in this room right now that there's an addiction that's paralyzing us. There's many of us in this room. It might've just been a few hours prior to coming here that you struggled with a panic attack. Many of us are, are paralyzed emotionally that we, we deal with depression and anxiety. Many of us in this room, there's, there's some financial issues that we're struggling with or we got a really bad doctor's report this week that there's some areas of our life that we would say, yeah, there's, there's some paralysis and, and really without the touch of Jesus, I don't know how I'm gonna be able to continue to move forward. I'm telling you what, when we come in contact with somebody like that, God just wants us to be the church. Don't just walk past it. Stop for a moment. Turn and say, how can I pray for you? How can I help you? Can I grab a corner of your life and get you to Jesus? Because I've seen Jesus heal before, and I know that he can do it again if I can just get you to Jesus. Well, back to the story here, because in verse 4, it says, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd. This is so interesting to me. Here, Jesus is in the room, the one person that can change your life, and we can't even get into his presence because there's just too many people. The crowd was too big. So they made an opening in the roof. Now, time out just for a minute. Can we just leave the verse there? I love when I'm reading scripture, I put myself in the story. It's, it's how I actually receive from God's word. So I imagine, like, what in the world was that like? Because we can read so quickly through it just to kind of check our box. Oh, yeah, I read the Bible today. And we don't, two minutes later, we, have no, we don't even remember what we just read. So I take some time. I slow down a little bit. I'm like, okay, let me imagine. What was that like? So a room like this, Jesus is preaching so many people around. And these four guys come with someone that's paralyzed. They know if they could just get them, and they show up, and there's no way in. There's so many people in the room, out in the foyer, doors are open to outside, windows are open, like there's everybody standing around the building even, they can't even get in the door, so they decide to get on the roof. Now imagine that for a minute, imagine that that was today, so many people in here, four guys show up with a friend on a map paralyzed, how did they get on, how in the, how'd you get on the roof how did you do, like, seriously, picture this. Like, how did you do that? Did, did a couple of you go up with ropes and you, you pull them up and then we, somewhere underneath put, like, how? And then Jesus is preaching and all of a sudden something kind of falls on his head and he swats. Maybe it's a fly. Like, is it, and there's a little bit more drywall and debris. We hear this, this, all this noise happening on the roof. He must have stopped preaching. All kinds of debris starts falling down. Why? Because look what it says. It says, and after digging through it, They dug through the roof. I don't know what it would take to make a hole big enough to lower a man down through, but it's a decent sized hole. And they dug through the roof and lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. Just imagine just for a moment what that could have been like. I mean, we we could have an awkward moment in in a service like this and everyone stops for a second. It's like, is this okay? Are we allowed to laugh? Are we allowed to like? But this was was a total stoppage, time out. What in the world's going on? People are getting ticked off. We just gave to the building project and look at these dudes, it's total. And they lowered him in front of Jesus. It's crazy. What does it mean to be the church? Look at this, verse five, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, He saw something, because again, the hole's big enough. He sees this man lowered down. All this is happening, and Jesus must have looked like, who's doing this? And he must have seen these four friends just leaning over the hole, just smiling. (laughs) Just pointing out, come on, Jesus, do it. Let's see it. Do it, Jesus. Heal them. So full of faith. They just knew if they could. I mean, you know you're full of faith if you're willing to do that amount of work to get somebody into the presence of God. 
Jesus saw their faith and then he looks at the paralyzed man that's now on the floor in front of him and he said, sons, your sins are forgiven. What does it mean to be the church? Number two, it means that we have faith for others. We'll do the heavy lifting, but we also believe we have faith for others. I just know if I can just get you there. If you would just come to church with me today, if you would just get in the room and experience the presence of God and, and hear the word of God, I know that God can move in you. If you would just open up your heart to him and say yes to Jesus, I know Jesus will save you. I know he'll move in your marriage. Listen, I've got faith for you because I saw what he did before. I know what he can do again. And for me, I know that I can look at a, I can look at a marriage that's paralyzed on the brink of divorce. And because I've experienced some suffering in my marriage and I've experienced the healing of Jesus in my marriage. I believe for your marriage. I know what it's like to be addicted, to be ravaged by an addiction. And I also know what it's like to experience the healing and the freedom of my Lord Jesus Christ. And wherever you are, I've got faith for you. I know what it's like to be so upside down financially, to be in debt up to my eyebrows. We had six credit cards, full on $50,000 of credit card debt car payment. We couldn't afford a house, a half million dollar home in New Jersey. We couldn't even afford to pay that. And I watched God do something within a nine month period of time where he completely turned our mortgage around, got into a fixed rate, changed all of that, but also removed $60,000 of debt within six months because I was willing to repent for making really bad choices for my family. <laughs> And then I opened myself up to accountable voices in my life that would give me wisdom and direction. And I began to give faithfully tithe and bring my, bring my offerings to God and say, God, I trust you with my finances. Listen, I can't even make the hundred percent work. So I'm going to trust if I just bring the 10, you can make the 90 go further than hundred ever could. And he did it because I got faith for your finances. What does it mean to be the church? It means that we do the heavy lifting. It also means that we have faith for others. There's people that are walking through this door that are here today. Maybe it's you that could barely even get out of your car. It took a moment for you to catch your breath and to get enough strength and courage to even get out of your car and walk across the parking lot, in through the doors, people waving at you, being smiling, being friendly and all of that, but still it was like you were a nervous wreck. And yet we see it happen all the time that God can meet us right where we are. We gotta have faith for others. Well, back to the story, take a look at this, verse six. It says, so now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Again, time out. Leave that up there for a second. Somebody's life is being changed for eternity. And yet there's some of us sometimes, and I, listen, and I'm not even pointing the finger, because when I point the finger, there's one, yeah, pointing back at me, like, right? I can, so... I know, what, I know what it's like to have a critical spirit, a critical heart. I know what it's like to criticize. I know what it's like to judge. I know what it's like to experience that in my own heart. And this is happening in this room when a miracle is about to take place. So you have to understand when somebody was paralyzed or somebody was blind or somebody had a physical ailment or, or a disability of any kind, the culture of that day and age said there must be severe sin in that person's life or their family's life. So there was culturally, there was just extreme judgment all across the board. So when this man is lowered down, he's, already, he's being lowered down, he must be experiencing already such shame He's had people walk past him. People probably spit at him. People just shun. People walk away from him. So even already this day, he's got four people already showing concern and love and affection toward him, which he's not experienced before. And now all of a sudden, someone looks at you. I mean, just imagine the expression on Jesus' face looking at this man. Such love, unconditional love, such hope such purity, such value. And he looks down on him and says, your sins are forgiven. I mean, what must have happened on the inside of him in that moment? But when you ever say something publicly like this that is contrary to culture, immediately there's a, oh, hey, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And so that's what stirred up this criticism so what does it mean to be the church? Number three, it means that we will have critics. Anytime we're doing something good for God, there will be criticism. 
And we know what that's like. There's, there's two types of critics. There's critics that are outside the church, people that we run into in our neighborhood, and we might be wearing a rye shirt, or somebody says, hey, or, do you have a church? And you might have said no, and said, hey, do you want to come to my church? And, and, and they, they ask you, hey, well, what church is that? And you said, rye's church, and, and they go, oh, that church. Right? So we can have criticism outside the church, but we can also have critics within the church. If we were to put ourselves in the story, we could probably identify with three of the different characters in the story, we've got the, the four friends that had faith who were grabbing a corner and doing the heavy lifting. You might be that. You might be serving on the dream team. You might have just served in kids prior to this service, and now you're attending this one. And, or you, you might be attending this one, and you're getting ready to serve somewhere sometime throughout Rise Church today after this service. You're on the dream team, and you've been grabbing a corner, and you've been having faith for others. And maybe you've been somebody that's in, been inviting and bringing people. Keep doing that. God is working through you. He's, he's moving through you. So you might find yourself one of the four friends, but you also might find maybe you're the one on the mat. And there's an era of your life that's just paralyzed right now. And it took everything you could do just to get here. But there's a good chance that we might find ourselves one of these, these critics in the story. And the thing I know about criticism is, is that when we're critical, it's probably because we've been doing a lot more sitting than we have been carrying. It says they were just sitting there. I promise you, if they were one of the four friends that grabbed the corner of a mat and lowered him down, they would not have been critical of Jesus saying your sins are forgiven. Now, I, I, I'm, a, I'm imagining that you're a lot like me. You probably like food. Food's my love language. Anybody in here, food's your love language. Like food is my love. Like your pastors have been feeding me so well. That's why I love you so much. I had a great burger last night. I might, if we go, I might, I might get it again. Like that was so good. And I, I, love to, I love to eat, but I also like to cook every once in a while. And this was years ago. We're, we're, uh, our, our family, we didn't have cable. We, we had the rabbit ears from Radio Shack. Remember Radio Shack? Anyway, put the foil on the top, and you're trying to get it in. And somehow I was able to steer in PBS, and Lydia's Italian Kitchen was on. And I'm like watching her cook. I'm like, that looks so good. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to get her cookbook. So I order the cookbook and, and I open it up. I'm like, I want to make eggplant Parmesan. That sounds so good to me, eggplant Parmesan. So I turn it, I open it up, page 176 in the cookbook. And I know it. I'm not just saying that just to throw a number out. It literally is page 176 in this cookbook. And I open it up and I'm like, all right, eggplant Parmesan. I'm reading through. I'm like, all right, making the pasta, page 201. I'm like, I ain't making pasta. No way. But there's a sauce. Like any great chef, there's three recipes to make the one recipe that you're wanting to make within the cookbook. So I decided, I'm going to make the sauce. I'm going to make the eggplant. So I get the ingredients, you know, the whole list, go to the store, buy it all. And it's, you know, specific sized eggplants and the way that you've got to, you got to kind of peel the eggplant a little bit. You got to slice it in these specific size slices and you got to put kosher salt on it because you got to draw the moisture out of it. You got to let it sit there for an hour. And while it's doing that, you're preparing the sauce and you get everything right. And, and then you, 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 uh, you dredge the eggplant and you've got a little flour and then egg and then breadcrumbs. And then you fry it till you get this beautiful crisp crispy golden brown. It's so good. Anybody hungry right now? It's like, it's so good. Sauce is cooking and you pull out the, that, that nine by 13 inch casserole Pyrex dish, the glass dish that like I was raised on casserole. My last name should have been casserole. My mom was like, Hey, we're having, you know, spaghetti pie tonight. I'm like, it's a casserole. Chicken all the king. My, it's a casserole, right? Like I was raised on tuna noodle casserole. No, thank you. No, thank you. So raise on cast. Anyway, you pull this pan out and you ladle some of the sauce in there and you grab your, your block of Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. No, I did not just speak in tongues. You're safe. Everything's fine. It's a, it's a specific cheese and you grade that cheese over top of the sauce and you grab your fresh basil and you start tearing it and you can feel, you can smell the aroma from the, the basil coming up and you just, you pull that apart and then you take your, your fresh mozzarella, not the crafts grated in the bag, no fresh, pull it apart, put it on top, layer that thing up and you get it in the oven, you bake it. And I'm telling every single, I make this two or three times a year for my family. Every single time, and this just happened a couple months ago, every single time as we're eating it, someone has a critique and it's always good. It's always to make it better. It gets better every single time. A little more fresh ground, you know, the, the cracked red pepper. We, we need a little bit more of that. Or my wife likes a little less sauce because she likes the crispy eggplant. And so we, we're, we're always critiquing it to make it better. Very different from when I go to Olive Garden. And I show up and they're not even happy I'm there. I know they're not because they sit me by the bathroom. And I always hear the same thing. You probably hear it too. Hey, we're, the, the breadsticks aren't ready yet. Hey, Olive Garden, you got one job. 
one job. Meet me at the door with the warm breadsticks. Like, let's just start there. Like, everything would turn around, right? And I'll order the eggplant parm, and I'll order it, and immediately, like, I'm pulling out my phone. I'm opening up Yelp. I'm taking pictures. I'm already getting ready for my review. Woo! Why? Why are we so critical? Because it's a lot easier to criticize something that you have not helped to create. And Rise Church, can I tell you, when we're, if we're going to be the church... We've got to know how to overcome criticism, criticism without, criticism within a room, but also criticism within us. How to, how to allow Jesus to heal a critical heart. Well, let's get back to the story here. What does it mean to be the church? Verse 8, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say? I love how Jesus didn't say which was harder. He asked them, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk. Number four, what does it mean to be the church? It means that we always remember that the whole point is life change. The whole point of it's life change from everything that we're doing is life change from from setting up signs outside to to greeting people as they walk in to the man event. It's it's all about life change. The man event is about life change that you would be able to invite a coworker, a neighbor to come with you for axe throwing at church. My God. It's about life change. Three services on a Sunday. The loaves and fishes offering. It's about life change. That your obedience, your willingness to be generous, to be open-handed so that God can take what you're giving him to, like Jesus, bless the loaves and fishes. He will bless, he will speak a blessing on what you're bringing to cause it to multiply so that more lives can be changed for eternity. It's about life change. It's not about an offering. It's not about another service. It's about, it's, it's, it's the, the dream team, getting on the dream team. It's not about just getting on a team and serving and, and volunteering some time. No, no. It's about being a part of the body of Christ, allowing God to take the very gifts and the callings that he saw in you and spoke in you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. If you've never even said yes to a relationship with Jesus yet, you need to know that the loving creator God that created you has a plan for you even before you were born, knew you by name, appointed gifts and talents and callings within you so that they could be used, partnered together with the church to be able to do great exploits for the kingdom of God. The whole point is life change. See, the Pharisees thought the whole point was just to sit there and argue about everything that was happening. Argue the scripture. Oh, that's not what that verse means. That's not what you took it out of context. Argue all of it. All of it. And Jesus like, man, you guys are missing it. So let's just deal with forgiving of sins and healing of bodies. Let's just see people's lives changed. I love verse 10. It says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So I, he, Jesus is basically like, listen, you heard me say your sins are forgiven. You're questioning whether I even have the right to say that. Let me show you how I have the right to say that, right? I, and he says, now he's done talking to them. Now he looks at the paralyzed man again with those loving, unconditional eyes. Now, the expression that Jesus was looking at the religious people, I don't want that one. I want the one that he looked at with the paralyzed man because I'm sure it changed in the moment. Like, it was dad's look, right? Dad's look, the scowl, like, come on, guys. Turn the lights off. Close the cabinet. Right? That sort of dad voice. Yeah. Am I the only dad that tells your kids to turn the lights off? And like, I walk through the kitchen and I'll shut five cabinets. Like, why am I shutting cabinet doors? Does no one else matter? Shut a cabinet door. Like, shut the pantry door. For the love, I will not feed you again. <laughs> right? But he looks at a totally different expression, right? From the religious leaders to the paralytic. I tell you, son, get up, take your mat, and go home. What does it mean to be the church? It means that we go home different than we came. Every single time, we go home different than we came. So back to the three people in the story. Maybe you're here today and you find yourself paralyzed in an area of your life. The whole point of what we're doing right now is that when you get up and you walk out these doors, that you would have allowed Jesus to do something in your life and you will go home different than the way that you came. Maybe you've been grabbing a corner and you've been using your gifts and you've, been, you're, you've gone through the growth track and you're on the dream team and you've been serving Sunday after Sunday. You attend one and you serve one. And you might be feeling tired or needing more faith. Today, Jesus has that for you. 
And he wants you to receive it. He wants you to be refreshed. He wants you to, to be encouraged. He wants vision to rise up in you again and faith to rise up in you again. He wants you to go home different than the way that you came. And if you've been struggling with criticism, you've been doing a lot of sitting and not enough carrying, and you found a critical spirit in there and just judging everything and questioning everything and questioning the you know, being critical even when people's lives are being healed and changed and you find yourself there. I've, I've been there. I found myself there. Jesus wants you to go home different than the way that you came. Today can be the day where forgiveness can flow and healing can flow and hope can come into your life wherever you are on your spiritual journey. The point is that we go home different Here's the last verse, verse 12. He got up. Oh man, we can read past that really fast, can't we? I mean, think of it. He was paralyzed. We don't know how long, but it was long. People had walked past him, judged him for years. Maybe you've experienced that. People walk past you. They see your struggle. They see a disability. They see pain. They, they see your, your marriage and they don't even want to talk to you about it anymore. They're just, because they don't even know what to say or they, they see you grieving. They see you experiencing loss and they don't even know how to come around you. And, and so you feel alone and feel left and feel hopeless and you've just been living in paralysis but one encounter with Jesus and you stand up in a way that you've not been able to stand up before. He stood up, he grabs his mat, and I love this phrase, he walks out in full view of them all. Walks out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone, and they praised God saying, I've never seen anything like that before. I've seen, I've seen people's marriages a wreck and I've seen divorce over and over and over again, but I've never seen a marriage that was on the brink of divorce healed and see them fully in love like they were just married. I've never seen that before. I've never seen somebody so upside down with debt to see them fully debt-free, able to be so extremely generous because of a touch of Jesus. I've never seen that before. I've never seen somebody just riddled with anxiety, and depression, going after doctor after doctor appointment, trying to get medicine correct and right. And now they don't even need meds and they're, they're, they're full on full of peace and Kurt, I've never seen anything like that before. Hey, Rise, when was the last time someone looked at your life and said, I've, I've never seen anything like that before. So I know what it's like to hide. I've hid areas of my life for years. Didn't want anybody to see it. I just wanted to avoid, I just wanted to stay hidden. But here's the thing about hiding, is we're actually not that good at it. People really do see, people really do know. They might be avoiding us and walking around and we think that we're free, but they know, they see it, they can tell. They also can tell when healing's taking place. And I don't know about you, but I want people to look at my life and I want something to change in them because what does it say happened here it says we've never it was in full view of them all they all knew it was Jesus and they said we've never seen anything like this before here's the result of being the church from doing the heavy lifting for having faith for others for dealing with the critics from remembering the whole point is life change and going home different the whole point the result is others around us will see the life change and they won't be drawn to us and they won't even be drawn to our church they'll be drawn to Jesus the son of the living God so can we do this as we finish up would you stand to your feet rise church with me just for a moment and as you stand would you just kind of find yourself in a, in a prayerful attitude close your eyes just Kind of bow your head, just be in a moment of prayer. If you're in this room today, or maybe you're even online at the sound of my voice, you're watching this, but you recognize that maybe the one area of your life that's paralyzed is that you're paralyzed spiritually, which means that you're recognizing that there's sin in your life, you're separated from God, or you've never said yes to a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's, he's not your Lord or your God yet, but he wants to be. And today is your day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So if that's you, no one's looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, but if that's you, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I just wanna pray for you right where you are. 
So on the count of three, would you raise your hand saying, I wanna receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I wanna surrender my life to him. I want Jesus to come on my heart and wash me clean of my sin. If that's you on the count of three, would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Just raise your hand, hands going up all over the room. Keep your hand up just for a moment. Come on, Rise Church, let's pray this prayer together. Say, dear Jesus, come on, everybody together. Say, come into my heart, forgive me of my sin, wash me clean and make me new today. And make this a bold confession. I commit from this day forward that I will follow you all the days of my life. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now stay in this prayerful attitude just for a moment. Stay prayerful just for a moment. For everyone else, even those that just prayed that prayer for the first time, if you recognize that you're someone else in that story that needs a touch from Jesus, This is your opportunity to receive it. Worship team's gonna lead us in another chorus of a song during this moment. I want you to receive what God has for you. I want you to sing along with them or just even open your hands to receive from God. Say, God, whatever you need to do in me, do. I don't wanna leave here the way I came. I don't want, if it's, if it's, you need something to touch, an emotional touch, let them touch you. If it's a mental touch, let them touch you. If it's a physical touch, let them touch you. If it's something going on in your spirit, would you let Jesus touch you? Walk out of this place different than the way that you came because of an encounter with the Son of the living God. Come on, let's worship God together.